Before we start to look at actual programming in x86, I want you to understand a little bit about the different operation modes as well as the features that are available for x86 processors. So we're going to start off by just discussing a little bit about the different modes of operation, and I just want you to be familiar with each of them, as um, we're mostly going to work in the first mode, which is protected mode, but the other modes do exist, and they're good to know about in case you're ever really working on things like um, operating systems or hardware, or things that require these different system modes to be used. So to give you some ideas, uh, there's protected mode, there's real address mode, and there's system management mode. Uh, protected mode is the native processor state, which means that it's the state that the processor is in by default, and it's the one that you're most commonly going to be using throughout all the time that you're programming on x86-based devices. The idea of protected mode is that multiple processes can run, but they're each given their own section of memory, and they have to stay within that section of memory. So they can't interact with other processes directly, like they can't modify a different processes' memory. And that allows us to stop from illegal operations that could possibly cause a process to fail, or something to go wrong based on modifications of memory that doesn't belong to you. So that'd be the idea of protected mode. In protected mode, every feature is available to you, and you can do anything that you really want to do, as long as it's within those bounds of not modifying another process's memory and not doing anything that is um, sort of illegal of an operation. Real address mode is something that was implemented with early Intel programming environments, so some of the earlier x86 chips were using real addressing mode. And essentially, the main idea with real addressing mode is that it's allowing you to really directly access hardware components. So this is really useful if you're gonna be working at a hardware level and interacting with hardware devices because it allows you to more easily access those devices. However, it's not something that we're going to be doing by default. So we typically stay in protected mode unless we need that operation in which we case um, we could typically switch into the real address mode and do that. Then finally, we have the system management mode, which provides an operating system uh, for mechanisms uh, such as power management and security. And the main use of system management mode is if we're designing a system very specific to a chip. So it's very specifically designed for that chip. In that case, we might use system management mode in order to provide that operating system um, through the processor. It allows us to be able to build something sort of more specific to the processor rather than more generic to many different processors. So really protected mode is the main one to keep in mind. It's the one that we're going to be using throughout uh, these videos. And um, if we introduce any of these other topics uh, as we're using them, I'll remind you of them again and we'll talk about some of the context of how we're using them. Now, in addition to the modes, we also need to understand a little bit about some register fundamentals. Uh, x86 is a 32-bit processor, which means that each register is 32 bits in size. So typically the registers are labeled as I've shown here, like EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. In the next slide, I have an example of some common uh, registers that are typically used. There's actually quite a number of registers that exist, but um, we'll mostly stick to the most common ones and then introduce others as they're needed. Now, a key note that I want to bring up is that the E stands for, I think, extended, and it indicates that we're accessing all 32 bits of the register. With x86, there's some interesting features where we can actually access just specific bits of the register itself. So for example, if you wanted to store just 16 bits, you could drop the E and just reference like AX or BX or CX or DX. So you see, I just removed the E from that. That allows me to specify just 16 bits of the register rather than using the whole 32 bits. The reason why you might want to do this is because you might have a number that can only be 16 bits in size. So it makes it easier for you to be able to represent that properly. I could give you a, a sort of more concrete example. So if you were working with um, a 16-bit signed number, remember that the, the um, furthest to the left bit is going to be indicating the sign. So if it's 1, it's negative. If it's 0, it's positive. If you were to do this as a 32-bit, you would have a 1 in the, um, in the 16th slot right, for that 16th bit. And if you were to do any sort of operations, the 1 could carry over to the 17th bit. And that doesn't necessarily represent exactly what we're doing with these numbers because it's only a 16-bit number. We don't want that sign bit to carry over from the addition. So what we could do instead is we could indicate it as a 16-bit number. That way, if an addition happens that results in a carry, we're not going to have it carrying over to the next bit because it understands that these are 16-bit numbers, not 32-bit numbers. So that's sort of an example of why you might want to do this. And similarly, we have 8-bit high and 8-bit low, which allows you to represent um, the rightmost 8 bits or the leftmost 8 bits of a register. 
And the main reason why you might want to do this is because if you have a lot of 8-bit numbers, you could actually store more of them in these 32-bit uh, registers rather than using the whole register, right? So if I have, say, two 8-bit numbers, I could put um, one of them in the lower half and one of them in the upper half, and then I could represent two 8-bit numbers using a single register. So you can see it just sort of helps us to work more efficiently. So AH would be the high 8 bits of the A register, right? So rather than EAX, we're using AH. And then AL is the lower 8 bits. So instead of using AX again, we're using AL in this case. So this gives you some of the ideas of these fundamentals of working with these registers. Now here I'm just giving you some uh, some of the other registers that exist on the system and some of the uses for them. Uh, a lot of the registers in x86 have a specific use case that is usually um, used for them. Uh, however, uh, some of them are just general purpose as well. In general, you can use pretty much all of these registers in whatever way you like. Um, I just wanted to give you some of the common conventions of the ways that they're used, right? For, like for instance, EAX is typically used as an accumulator. So it's used for multiplication and division instructions. So if you're using those types of instructions, EAX would be a good register to use for those uh, results. And we'll see that as we continue to introduce these instructions. Um, EBX and EDX are general purpose. ESI and EDI are actually high speed memory transfers. So they're really designed to be able to transfer memory quickly. Um, ECX is typically used as a loop counter by the CPU. So if we're moving through a loop, and we want to keep incrementing the value, ECX is usually where that happens. The two that you wouldn't ever really modify directly would be EBP and ESP. Um, ESP is a pointer to the current stack address. So the stack is memory, right? So it actually represents the RAM memory for your current program. So it's that segment of memory that you get in protected mode. And basically, if we can't store things in registers, because registers are only 32 bits in size, so like for example, if you had like a list of numbers, you'd have to store those somewhere where you have more space. So you would typically store those on the stack. What the ESP does is it points to the next available location in stack memory for you to be able to put something on there. So it tells you where you can put data onto the stack. EBP is a register that is used to reference um, function parameters and local variables on the stack. And I'm gonna say, don't really worry about EBP too much. You're going to see this in a lot more detail when we actually discuss how functions work in x86 and we start to interact between C and x86 as well. So don't worry about EBP quite yet. Uh, we will revisit that later on. But ESP would be the pointer to the stack address. So uh, again, something that we'll see as we continue on through this. I just wanted to introduce these so that they're um, just base familiarity. Um, when they come up again, you'll always know, oh, yeah, ESP is the stack pointer. And then we can sort of go into more detail of those later on. There's a few other special purpose registers that exist. Um, EIP is a register that points to the address of the next instruction. So it tells the CPU where the next instruction to execute is. This is something that you, again, wouldn't really modify directly. You could, but you wouldn't usually do it because um, you want the flow of instructions to flow based on the result of the last instruction, essentially. So, you know, it's either moving forward by a consistent amount or maybe it's jumping to another location in memory. Um, so this generally isn't something that you would really modify, but there are some cases where you might modify this instruction or you might do something with it, but uh, it's fairly uncommon. I just wanted to point it out as something that is available and something that is helping the process Processor, figure out where to go next. Then finally, we have e-flags, which is the flags to denote the status of an operation. So it can tell us different things that have happened in operations. So for instance, CF tells us if an operation had a carry. OF tells us if an operation had an overflow. SF tells us if a result was negative or positive. Uh, ZF would tell us if the result is zero. And there's a lot of other different e-flags that exist. And again, we'll introduce these as they're seen throughout these videos. So this should at least give you a base level of familiarity with the different components of x86. And from here, we're going to actually jump into programming x86, and you're going to see all of this live in action. And just rest assured that things are going to feel a lot more clear as you continue to program in x86. You'll continue to see a lot of these concepts. We'll keep talking about them. So if things feel a little bit overwhelming right now, don't worry. We're going to go into a lot more detail. We're going to continue to bring up these ideas. And by the end of this, you're going to be a master with x86 programming. So thank you for watching this video.
In the next video, I'm going to show you how to program your first x86 program. We're going to use NASM for this process, N-A-S-M. It's um, a language assembler that's used with um, Linux. However, you can feel free to follow along with any of the different language uh, compilers. Uh, there'll be some minor differences between them, so it's easiest to follow along with um, the ones that I'm using here. However, um, there will be a lot of similarities in this syntax, so it'll be slightly easy to follow along with other ones as well. That's what we'll take a look at in the next video.